Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Marissa Vedica, and as Jen um, had said, I'm here to talk about uh, word finding today. Um, but we will have a little bit of overlap with some of the other cognitive changes someone might experience as a result of cancer and the treatments. Um, but just kind of before we get started, I have to for UPMC and Centers for Rehab Services just kind of note that this isn't intended for any type of formal treatment or diagnostic. Um, but if you do have any symptoms related to the content, please feel free to reach out to any medical professional just to kind of guide you in your way. Um, I also have some resources at the end that can help you with that process as well. Okay, so the focus of our presentation today is going to be on word finding. Um, John Goldane gave prior presentations, I believe, on the topics of um, maybe language and cognitive issues as a result of the chemotherapy, uh, radiation, and treatments, but we're going to focus um, ours on word finding today. So to start out, um, I think it's important to also understand what is language, sorry. What is language? So as defined by the, the dictionary, it's really just the words, their pronunciations, how we combine words that are important for a community. Um, and that community is, is individualized. So my community you know, might be different than some of the other languages in another community. Um, it also is a form or manner of verbal expression in the, the vocabulary or the phraseology that we use that belongs to a department of knowledge. Essentially, we're always using language to communicate. So um, whether to communicate with those around us, whether it's verbal, nonverbal, which is like our, our gestures, pointing, our head nods and our head shakes, um, writing, and then also into reading and understanding. So language is really all encompassing and we might experience difficulty with language and word finding across any of these areas. So um, I think it's important for us to review, you know, while we have impairments in word finding, a lot of this can be observed following cancer treatment, but changes also, cognitive changes can also impact our memory, our attention and executive functioning. And briefly for today's purpose and for our presentation, it's really important to understand that these different cognitive areas also um, have a strong correlation with one another. So sometimes you might have some difficulty with memory, which then manifests itself as difficulty with coming up with words and word finding. So we're going to kind of dive into that a little bit first, just to start out. So first, we have what's called executive functioning, um, which is really a wide range of skills that we all use daily. Um, the first one on here I have is working memory. So that's our ability to hold and process information to store in our, in our brains. Um, a good example of that is uh, maybe having a conversation. You're having to kind of keep information in your head as somebody's talking and trying to kind of process what they're saying in order to remember it and, or, and in order to store it. We have initiation, which may be difficult um, to initiate an activity on our own without any prompting, sequencing and planning, which is to identify an overall goal for something, um, and also kind of relating to our ability to plan, to um, schedule out our days, our weeks, look at our calendars and, and plug things in. Maybe not as much now <laughs> amongst COVID, but you know, in, in other times, just being able to, to plan things out, sustain our intention, um, and to concentrate, which we'll talk a little bit more about attention in further slides. Um, and it also addresses our ability to recognize problems, um, provide solutions, and just kind of be aware of some of the things that are going on and some of the changes um, that we're having, or just kind of our, our own self-awareness of what we need to do and, and how to proceed with things. So next, we move on to memory. Um, and again, you know, with a lot of the other kind of umbrella terms, executive functioning, memory, and attention, we have a lot of different parts and a lot of different types of memory that we use really often, if not every day. So the first 
uh, piece of information for memory that we have is our immediate or our working memory, also going back to that executive functioning. And this is our ability to um, store information, whether it's our sight, our taste, our, our smell, um, or sorry, quickly store information, no matter what it be, temporarily. So this is typically just for a few seconds. So have you ever had a password, you get a code and you have to remember it in order to punch it in to get into a, like your phone or a password for a website or something like that, that would be your immediate memory, recalling, recalling temporarily for um, that moment. Then we have our short-term memory or what we would also call our recent memory. And this is information that's stored just long enough to be used. So in this situation, we're talking about maybe minutes, hours, days, beyond that, that few seconds mark. Um, this might pertain to trying to remind yourself to make a phone call to somebody or something that you have to do later on in the day or go back to the oven to make sure that you know, your recipe hasn't burnt. You know, th that's our, our short-term memory. The next step would be our long-term, which is our remote memory. Um, usually our long-term memory is pretty preserved, uh, but we can definitely have changes in it just depending on um, kind of different treatments and, and things throughout our, our entire lives. So these are things um, that have happened in the past or we call them episodes, um, childhood memories, remembering things that happened five years ago at a holiday dinner, uh, those kind of things are more long-term preserved. Then we have our perspective memory, which is our ability to remember things in the future, going back also to that executive functioning and to plan. Uh, for example, recalling that you have an appointment coming up and planning to have lunch with a friend based on an appointment that you have to re also remember and to manage. We have our visual memory, or we also call it our spatial memory which is our ability to just recall pictures, recall images. Um, has anybody had trouble remembering where they parked? I know I have. <laughs> so uh, just kind of recalling where you've parked by visualizing maybe a sign that you parked by or something like that, having that visual reminder in your mind. Then we have our motor memory, which is remembering a motor skill, like trying to return to ride a bicycle, typing without looking, things like that. We have our procedural memory, which is kind of just remembering a process or a procedure, like how to cook your favorite recipe without having to look back. Um, kind of, I know sometimes in a working environment, a lot of things can be procedural and you, that sometimes is actually preserved because it's a process, because it's ingrained in our minds over a period of time. And then finally, we have our verbal or our auditory memory which is just using words, it's our language. It's our ability to remember and put together a story to remember. And then the last piece of this cognitive puzzle that we have is our attention. So just like with everything else, we have all different types of attention. And there are four major ones that we'll just briefly talk about. The first one that we have there goes back to the executive functioning but is our sustained attention and our ability to pay attention or concentrate for long periods of time. Um, for example, reading, listening to this lecture, this is all part of your sustained attention. Our selective attention goes um, into our ability to be able to drown out background noise, to help focus on a specific topic, um, or, or something within your environment. So your ability to drown out um, music while you're on the telephone or drown out something happening in the background as you're listening to this lecture. This is all part of your selective attention. Then we have our divided attention, which is your ability to pay attention to two or more things at one time. However, um, I think something that's really important to remember is our brains aren't meant to multitask, none of ours. So even if five, 10 years ago, you were great at managing three, four things at a time, your brain isn't able to process and to give 
100% effort to multiple things at one time. And I know sometimes that could be more difficult, especially after, you know, a, a whole variety of diagnosis, a whole, you know, there's a lot that can affect our brain and it becomes a lot more difficult to manage multiple things at one time. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, we have processing, which is our ability to speed or our ability and speed to process information, whether it's stuff that we're hearing, stuff that we're seeing, um, and it's just our ability to kind of keep up with what's happening. So this kind of goes again back to that conversation example. It's really important um, for us to be processing and understanding and staying on top of what's being heard. And this all really ties in together because we can't, we can't remember things that we're not paying attention to. None of us can. So um, when some with one of these areas is affected, it really can affect our, our day to day and even tie into that word finding and that language that we were talking about. Okay. So just to also kind of briefly touch on, there are other things that also affect our ability to think and to find words. Um, sleep is very important. Um, poor diet and hydration can affect our thinking. It can make us, which we'll talk about in a little bit, feel a little bit foggy. Um, not being as active can affect our, our thinking for the same reasons. And also just limited or reduced social action or social interactions can also affect our ability to think and to find words and to kind of stay on top of the things that we normally would, would be able to express or remember. Okay, so how does this impact our word finding? <laughs> kind of the, the reason that we're here today and the bulk of this presentation. So difficulty with recall can really affect our ability to recall specific names, places, objects, things like that in a conversation without language itself even being affected. So have you ever um, been engaging in a conversation and you try to think you're kind of stuck on naming a specific restaurant or somebody's name or a street that they lived on? that memory, that difficulty with memory affects your ability to converse and affects your ability in that moment to come up with the word that you would like to say or to express. Again, like I said, processing. So um, if somebody in a conversation has moved on to the second or third topic or just even you know steps, first you're gonna do this, next you will do this, last you will do this, if it's hard to stay on top of what's being said, we're missing information. Difficulty with focus or being distracted can affect our conversations and our ability to come up with words. I know I, I definitely get distracted very easily. So even for myself at work, um, it's hard for me to work in our, our staff office. I have to sit in my own office and work or else it, it really affects how I think. And, and how I'm coming up with words as I'm typing things and even coming up with this presentation, it really um, can affect my, my attention can very much so affect my word finding. And then the last part of this is it's if it's difficult to maintain your thought in a conversation or sequence a conversation, that can affect your ability to come up with words. Okay, so what do you do next? So we have a little bit of a background on memory, executive functioning, attention, and how those affect our word finding. So what does this mean? So if you've experienced any of these symptoms, I always recommend first just reaching out to your physician. If you're already in therapy, you can also express this with your clinician, whether that be your physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech or cognitive therapist. So it's just important first to express your concerns and discuss all of your symptoms. You know, I'm not sure if you guys have had the experience, but sometimes, you know, very much so this is a multifactorial approach. So things aren't always clear cut. And, and so it's really important to, to talk about everything so we can weed out what the actual problems are. And the last part, you know, with that is make sure, you know, you're considering all of your medications and talking to your doctors about your medications because some of them do have those side effects. You know, while they're managing other things in our lives and, 
and helping with treatments, they can make us maybe feel foggy, um, feel tired, then make us feel more confused, harder to focus, which snowballs into some of these other cognitive processes like word finding. Um, so, so kind of my piece, this puzzle is cognitive therapy. So sometimes when people hear the, the term speech therapy, they say, oh, I talk fine. I, I don't need any speech therapy. But I always kind of joke that we're from, from here up. We're speech therapy, we're language, we're cognitive swallowing, um, which is something that we a lot of times will have um, with clients with head and neck cancer. So really cognitive therapy encompasses a lot of things. Um, we can address these deficits in attention, in memory, uh, visual spatial skills. I'm not sure if, if John talked about that at one point. I thought maybe he did, I could be wrong. Um, the word finding, the reasoning and the, the problem solving. So our goal as speech language pathologists, as cognitive therapists is to really focus on exercises, focus on tasks that can help um, and, and strategies that can help improve function, whether it be word finding, attention or memory, you know, what, what have you. Um, I personally like to, when I have a new client, like to focus as much as I can on function. So if somebody is at work, okay, what is, what's going on at work? What are you having trouble coming up with when you're, is it when you're in a meeting? Is it interviewing for jobs? Let's work on word finding in those situations. So a speech therapist um, really can help with providing some strategies and tools to help, help improve these impairments. So this, these next few slides might be one of the more beneficial pieces that we're gonna talk about today. Um, like I said at the beginning, this isn't a diagnostic or a you know, recommend, recommendation for treatment, but these are you know, geared towards things that you can maybe implement if you've noticed as we're going through this presentation that you're having difficulty in certain areas. So we're gonna first start out by talking about some strategies. Okay, so we've identified that we're having some trouble with coming up with words but what do I do? So I kind of broke this up into two different parts. It takes two to communicate, right? At least two people. So we can't always put all the pressure on ourselves to be the ones to communicate. There are strategies that are helpful for both sides. And it's really important um, also for our family members to understand that too, because they can very much so help in communication and um, in this word finding process. So the first part we'll talk about for the speaker. So this would typically be um, the person that's having the trouble with coming up with words. So for this, and I, I always say this too, it is okay to use these strategies. Um, I, a lot of times will have people and clients tell me, well, I don't wanna cheat. It's not cheating. It's a tool, it's here to help you. It's here to help me. It's here to help all of us. And sometimes we all do these things. It's just sometimes we might have to use it more frequently than others, and that's okay. It's okay to use these things. Okay, so as a speaker, especially if we're um, an individual having the trouble with coming up with words, one of the things you can do is to substitute a word. So um, as long as you're not changing what you're trying to say, as long as you're not changing your message, it is okay to substitute a word for something else. Um, now, if you want to say dog, you can't substitute cat. That, that would kind of change the flow of your conversation. But I've had a lot of, in the past, um, like teachers and people who talk a lot in their meetings, and we've done, like I mentioned, some mock tasks in therapy. And, you know, I've, I've had teachers come up with lectures and give me the lecture. And I have no idea at the end that they had trouble finding words the whole time because they just substituted as they went. It's a, it's a really good strategy to use and it can be really effective. Like I said, as long as it doesn't change what you're trying to say. Um, the next strategy on here is to name the opposite of what you're trying to think of. Um, kind of going back to a simple, but the dog and cat example. If I'm trying to think of the word cat and it won't come out, 
I can say, oh no, no, it wasn't the dog, it was another animal. It was the cat. So thinking of the opposite of what you want to say can help you to cue yourself or at least lets the other person know what you're trying to say. So I should, I should have mentioned this when we talk, started talking about the strategies, but also the point of these is to just communicate. And if it helps you come up with a word, that's fantastic. But also if it at least helps the other person know what you're talking about, that's the other piece to this, to this puzzle. That's the other piece to the goal. The third strategy on here is to describe it. Personally, it's one of my favorites. Um, it can be really helpful. So if you're stuck on a word and you can't think of what it is and you can't get it out, you can try to describe what's it look like? What's it taste like? Where do you find it? Um, what category does it fall under? Is it a fruit? Is it a vegetable? Those types of things, again, can help you come up with a word or communicate your, in, your intention of the word that you want to, want to say. Um, Nonverbals are really helpful. Gestures, pointing, drawing. Um, and you can also try to visualize a word. Visualize the word itself. You can visualize the object and that can be a trigger to help you come up with the word you want to say. Um, and then the last one on here is to visualize, or I'm sorry, to think about the first sound or the first letter of the object that you're trying to think of. <laughs> so if you ever um, tried to think of a word and you say to yourself, A, B, C, D, E, E, her name is Eleanor, got it. So that, that letter trigger, that first letter can help you come up with the word that you want to say too. Okay, so kind of on the next piece of this is strategies for the listener. Um, so these ones are a little bit more straightforward, but you know, make sure first of all that when you're in a communication situation, especially if it's maybe high stress, um, Sometimes if we're in a high stress situation, it can be more difficult to um, come up with a word uh, or just to communicate. So it can be really important to make sure, first of all, that the person that you're talking to is paying attention um, and to limit some extra noise and distractions um, in your environments that, that might be um, kind of making the word finding worse. Um, Give yourself, if you're the speaker or if you're the listener, extra time. So sometimes, you know, I, I know this happens to me, I'll have trouble finding a word, but if I just take a few seconds, it just pops up in my head. The more that you're rushed, the more pressure is put on yourself or, or whomever, and it can be harder just in that aspect. Um, for also for the listener, don't assume that you know what some you know what somebody is trying to say and try not to interrupt or finish their sentences because a lot of times those words are there and it takes away kind of the the independent thought of just coming up with a word using other strategies um, if someone is having more difficulty using yes no question or prompting for cues can help and it really helps to you know for the listener to to speak slowly um, sometimes for the speaker also to slow down a little bit because then your your brain can kind of keep up with what you're trying to say and how you're trying to portray a message. Um, okay, so then we have some activities um, that you can maybe do at home. You know, if you're not quite comfortable with, with going to therapy or consulting a therapist now, or, you know, if this isn't something that's necessarily an issue, these can all be good good activities still to, to help prevent any progression of anything. Um, so the first and foremost is to use your strategies to communicate. Um, some activities would be just naming, describing objects around the house, um, even describe an item and, or I'm sorry, identify an item and try to describe it to someone without, without naming it. So if we use the example of a remote control, if we were kind of playing a game you know, guess what word I have in my head. It could be, I would say, it's something that has buttons, that's used to turn the television, that's used to turn on the television, it's used to change the volume, it uses, it's used to change the channel. Once somebody understands and can guess what you're trying to describe, at that point, they can jump in and say, oh, remote control. And this 
you know, that goes back to that description strategy, but it also is a therapy activity too. And the, and you can do the same thing in the opposite, have someone describe an item to you and then you try to name it. So some more activities continued. Um, it might be helpful to find a picture in a book or a magazine. I, a lot of times when I do this in therapy, try to um, find pictures that have a lot of details because that just it forces you to talk a lot more, um, identify a lot more objects in the picture. But you can find a picture um, and just describe as many of the picture or details in the picture as you can. Um, reading is excellent. Read the book, read or read the news, books, magazines, and then take that a step further and have conversations with somebody about what you read or or maybe how you felt about a specific article that you read. And, and that's a really good conversational task to work on that word finding. You can challenge yourself a little bit with some, some timed tasks. So think of a category and try to name as many items as you can in one minute within that category. Um, fruits and vegetables, boys' names, girls' names, cities, animals, anything like that. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. I wouldn't think anything too hard or, or too, too refined, um, but because it'll be hard to come up with a lot in a, in a short amount of time. But you can also think of many categories and just try to name three to five things in each category. And you can really tailor the, the difficulty of it just depending on you know, how well you're, you're doing with it. And my, my philosophy is talking is always the best therapy. So incorporating talking and using strategies into your daily activities is, in my opinion, some of the best stuff that you can do. Um, you know, I, I always give homework <laughs> for my clients. So, and, and sometimes they don't do the homework, but it, it's not a big deal because they do a lot of things conversationally. So I might say, they might say, oh, I didn't do my homework, but I read recipes to my wife out loud and, and any time that she went to get an ingredient out, I named it. I read maybe the how many, um, how much she needed for the recipe, where it fell into the recipe. That's still, that's still talking, that's still word finding and it's a good activity. And it's something important, salience matters. So things that are, I think it's salience, but things that are important to you um, are the most important things to talk about because they can generalize to other aspects of life. And, you know, as much as we can right now, you know, staying social is really important. Um, you know, and even now there are ways, you know, we're meeting via Zoom. So tell, talking on the telephone with family, friends, whomever, video conferences, FaceTime, all of those things are really good um, functional things that you can do to continue to address your word finding. Okay. Um, sometimes people prefer more structured things to do at home and that's, that's okay. Um, we, a lot of times, excuse me, even with structured things go back to, this is great to do, but try to use a strategy to help you come up with more responses. Always going back to that. Um, you know, their puzzles and games, sorry, I broke this down into two different things, puzzles and games on the one side and then um, apps on the other. Um, so with puzzles and games, I find that a lot of clients like to do word searches, crossword puzzles. I'm personally, or person, personally terrible at crossword puzzles, so that wouldn't be my activity of choice. Um, but, you know, playing Scrabble, Bananagrams, categories, charades, these are all games that you can get the family involved in, um, you know, kind of have challenges with one another. If that's, you know, that's what you like to be a little competitive with it, um, but still working on word finding. Then we have some apps on the other side of the page. Um, most of these are free. Um, I know, I'm not sure if Heads Up, Head, um, this is a, a fun game that goes back to that barrier naming, describing things. Um, there might, that one might have a small fee to it, um, but that's a really good game. Chain of Thought, Wordscapes, Word Ladder, um, Word to Word Association, Four Picks, One Word. Those are all some different apps that I know uh, my colleagues and I like to use and, and incorporate in therapy. Um, 
the last two on there, so you'll see one that says Lingrathica, and I have no associations with these companies. Um, you'll see one that's called Lingrathica and one that's called Tactus. So both of these have a lot of uh, resources. They have a lot of resources, a lot of apps. They're, they're not typically as difficult as some of the apps that some of the other apps that you might experience or that you might try. Um, but like the, the Lingrathica, they have a, an app called Talk Path Therapy. And it's a really good, it's a really good app. It has a whole variety of tasks from memory to problem solving to reading and comprehending to language. Um, and you can change the complexity levels on them, which is nice. So if you try an app out at a level one and it's way too easy, you can always increase the complexity level of it. In my experience, they change a lot, um, especially in the news section. They, they keep current news on there. Um, it's not always the same articles. There are things really going on in the world. Um, so that's a really good app and it's free. It also can be accessed on a desk desktop or a laptop too at their website. Some of their other apps um, have free trials, but they're really limited. And it's the same thing with that Tactus company. Um, they both have a lot of other specific apps, but they um, usually have a fee. Um, you'll also probably, I'm sure you've heard of some other companies out there. You've seen commercials for, um, you know, different cognitive programs. And while those can be helpful, there's, there's no research that says buying into these programs at this time anyway, is going to get you X, Y, and Z results. So I always say free is fine. And if there's something that you find that you like, hey, stick with it and, and that's okay. Um, but some of these ones on here can be a really good starting place. And I even sometimes if I get sick of what I have in therapy, I'll just do a quick search word finding games, memory games, um, executive functioning games. And there's always new stuff coming out. And so for this last section, um, these are some websites that you might find helpful um, to, to address word finding and again, other cognitive aspects. Uh, the first one on there, memoryimprovementtips.com. It is, it's one of my favorites that I use a lot. Um, it actually has about 276 free games on there. Um, and again, from a whole variety of, of cognitive um, goals, but two of the ones on there for word finding are Scrabble or I think that might be Scra supposed to be Scrabble, um, Spirit and Bookworm. Um, I'm going to skip the middle one for a second and just jump down to the last one, but the last one is called braincurls.com. It's a, a similar website, not quite as many games, but again, it's things are broken up into category. So you can, you know, kind of change up what you would like to do for the day. Um, but they are, there is um, a game, they have some verbal ability games and there was, there was a list of them. So I didn't want to list all of them on there, but there's a section um, of just verbal ability games. And then to jump back up to the second one, the AARP, um, if you are a member, has excellent brain games. I have, I used to use them all the time. Um, even like I would have 12, 13 school aged concussion um, kids and I would use their brain games. They were, I loved them, but you now have to be a member in order to use them. So if you are, they have, they probably, um, it would be worth a shot to look at them and see if they have any word games or cognitive games too. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up, um, the kind of lecture portion of it has ended, but um, I hope you're able to gain some understanding of word finding issues as a result of cancer and, and some of the treatments that we go through and um, at least have some good resources to turn to. I also can be a resource for you. So if you need anything, I work at the Lemieux Sports Complex in Cranberry, um, but I you can give me a call and I'll do my best to get back to you. Or maybe, I don't know if Jen um, can maybe somehow get you in contact with either myself or my boss who also does the meetings, um, but we're here, we're on your team and you know, we're, we're here to help with anything, even if it's just a, 
a quick question about something or a suggestion, you know, we're, we're here for you. So um, with that, do you have, does anybody have any questions? 